And we are live. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Maria Skura and I'm running the International Dialogue here at Das Progressive Zentrum here in Berlin. And I have the great pleasure and honor to chair the session today, the last session of the 2020 edition of the Progressive Governance Conference that we call the Progressive Governance Digital Summit under the circumstances we have we decided to launch the conference in a completely new format and so after this experiment of the last four days i'm happy that we still meet together today in a really good company of 15 people thank you so much for being with us uh, in uh, uh, this week and um, i'm really looking forward to hearing from you what are your uh, takeaways and what have you learned uh, well, this, the purpose of, purpose of this session, actually it has two purposes. First of all, as I said, we would like to reflect on what we have heard um, in, the, in the last four days, starting actually on Monday, because with some of you, I have, uh, we have already met earlier before the official launch of the PGS20. Uh, so let's think what we've heard, but also let's think how these, um, how these uh, lessons learned um, resonate with our scenario paper. Uh, the paper prepared for, the, uh, for this conference as a background paper that was presented on Tuesday during the inaugurational session. And uh, so we have around 90 minutes to do that. And these 90 min minutes will proceed as follow. We will first hear from Matthew Taylor. And uh, then I, I will invite also Anke Hassel to a conversation. And then we will briefly um, speak about the scenario paper. And then uh, last but not least, I would uh, like to invite all of you who are present in this call to actively participate. This call is not about us. This call is about you. You're also the protagonists of today's meeting. So um, that brings me to housekeeping rules. Uh, if you would want to comment or ask a question, please raise your hand. It's actually possible uh, via Zoom. So please just let me know that you have something to say or you can also send me a message via the chat function here in Zoom and I will happily uh, give you the floor and uh, give you the, the, the right to speak, so to speak. Um, but before, before we jump into the open mic, uh, jump into a broader discussion without further ado, um, I would like to uh, proceed to Matthew Taylor. Uh, Matthew Taylor who accepted our invitation for this session on Friday uh, to uh, provide us with a, let's put it this way, a keynote, but a, a, on an ending note, um, he, will, uh, uh, he, will, he will now um, share with us his thoughts on the way forward uh, about possible new social contract, about uh, possible mission for the progressives after the COVID, uh, COVID um, crisis has passed. Matthew was opening the PGS uh, conference last year. Um, so I think it's a, it's a great uh, coincidence or actually not a coincidence. It's great that you can um, give us some, some reflections and your thoughts on what you've learned this year. So Matthew, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Maria. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I, I want to share with you um, a perspective on um, the moment that we've reached uh, and the possibilities for this moment, uh, which has really evolved in my mind in the last few days, but harkens back to uh, the themes that were in my uh, lecture are very different circumstances uh, last year. Um, and uh, what I'm going to say over the next 10 uh, minutes may seem somewhat abstract, uh, but I hope that we can then in the conversation bring it to life in a more concrete way. But, but in a sense, I need to be quite schematic in painting the picture that I want to describe. Um, so, I want to put together two things. One is an analysis of the moment that we're in, and the other is to remind people of the framework which I used last year. When I say remind people, I don't think for a moment people are going to have remembered my great thoughts from 12 months ago. So 
uh, I, I will just kind of re re repeat the framework that I developed last year, and then I want to put them together. Um, and, and this attempt to put together the moment with the framework that I uh, have been working with for many years and I outlined last week, that's the new element of what I have to say. So the, the one way of thinking about the moment that we're in, and of course it's, it's run through the conversations we've had all week, is the relationship between crisis and change. And uh, one hypothesis about where we are uh, is that we are once again at the cusp of the decline of a prevailing system in favor of the emergence of a new system. And broadly, we can see this has happened in Europe uh, on three other occasions, if we look back over the last uh, 80 years. Uh, so we can see that the post-war settlement uh, was a response to the crisis, not only of the Second World War, but also of the 1930s, and an attempt to uh, understand what had gone wrong uh, in countries which had led to um, the, uh, the rise of authoritarian totalitarian regimes and then to war, but also to the economic crisis that had underlain that. And so then we have the post-war settlement, which is an era when we look back on it that looks pretty benign in terms of economic growth and relatively low levels of inequality and relatively consensual politics, um, and also the kind of gradual growing of freedom. We then see in the oil shock of the 1970s and the economic problems of the 1970s and also the sense that some of the kind of welfare regimes that had been established in the post-war era were no longer fit for purpose. Uh, we see a moment, um, and there are particular moments, the oil shock, uh, America's um, uh, uh, removal of the dollar as the kind of underpinning of a fixed exchange rate system. So there are various kind of particular moments, but what is really happening here is the erosion of that post-war settlement. And we see then the rise of a system which comes to be called neoliberalism. So we see the arise of a system which, which fundamentally assumes uh, that markets are the most efficient way of doing things and that uh, uh, individualism as a kind of ideology is the ideology of the modern era and the ideology that drives progress. Now, of course, you know, there are different varieties of this project in different countries. And, you know, when I'm talking at this highly generalized level about North America and Europe, you know, it, it, it elides all sorts of differences between countries. But nevertheless, you then see that neoliberal era, which is dominant but is starting to fray in all sorts of ways, both in terms of its political support, but also in terms of its economic and social uh, um, dysfunctionalities. And we see with the global financial crisis of 2007-8, we see that system losing legitimacy. It doesn't mean it disappears. In many ways, it continues as a kind of zombie system uh, that has a grip on systems, but yet has lost its kind of legitimacy and bearings and confidence. We, we then move into an era where populism becomes arguably, uh, or a kind of despotism, a kind of combination of populism and despotism becomes the kind of most powerful model. And again, not everywhere, but it, it, it kind of makes the weather uh, in terms of, it, it seems to be the project with the greatest dynamism. Um, uh, and... Now, populism is an incredibly dynamic uh, force, but it's also a highly contradictory and problematic force. And so perhaps it's not surprising that in the post-war era lasts kind of 30 years, neoliberal lasts, neoliberalism kind of lasts around 30 years, populism may be burning itself out uh, after 10 or, or so. Uh, uh, and by the way, in my talk, I'm not talking about what I think is definitely going to happen. I'm talking about what might happen. And it is certainly possible this is not uh, the point, a point of, of, 
a, a pivot away from populism, it could be an acceleration of populism. That's a genuine danger which we need to discuss and has been discussed this week. But I want to explore what, will it, what if this is a moment too that pivots to a new era and what might that new, what, what, what might we want that new era to be? And I want to describe the new era that we might be moving towards as the reflexive age. So that's the phrase that I want to try to get into people's heads uh, today, the reflexive age. And, and I will explain what I mean by that in a moment. So now just a recap uh, of the argument that I made last year. And that argument, uh, and I will really simplify it, was that sociology, psychology, other theories could lead us to think that it's useful to understand human nature in terms of three fundamental sets of drivers, that we are animated by firstly authority, we do what we're told, spend a lot of time doing what we're told. Secondly, we're animated by belonging. So we're animated by tribe, by values, by, by the, being the person that people like us are. And then thirdly, we're animated by some story of our own life, our own personal aspiration, our own journey, our own kind of self-authorship, as it were. And what I argued last year was that and we can perhaps get into this conversation if you want evidence for this, but that the best uh, policies, the most powerful organizations, the most powerful places and times, one of their characteristics is that they, they mobilize all three of these systems, the system of authority, the system of belonging, and the system of personal aspiration, and they hold them in creative tension. And that really drives progress. That really drives... So no, that is what starts to happen with the Enlightenment. And despite all the problems of the Enlightenment, and of course the Black Lives Matter moment reveal, reminds us of the deeply problematic nature of the Enlightenment in many ways. Nevertheless, the reason that history accelerates at an incredible pace following the Enlightenment is that for the first time these, with, the, with the unleashing of individualism, we see these three forces combining. And what I argued in my lecture last year was that progressivism needs to have an account of how we would seek to combine authority, belonging, and individual aspiration in a dynamic system, because that at the heart is what makes liberal democracy the most powerful system uh, for human progress. And I argued, however, that whilst that might sound fairly simple in a way, you know, well, this is a very simplistic theory, just these things also follow authority, follow belonging, follow your personal ambitions and the things will be okay. But I argued that it's difficult. And I argued that it was difficult for three reasons. The first is that each of these forces, the force of authority, the force of belonging and the force of personal aspiration are, are in conflict with each other. They are in part animated by a suspicion of the other motives. So in a sense, the story of authority is how do we drive progress in the face of the kind of defensiveness and the aversion to change that you see in tribalism? And how do we deal with individuals, messy, chaotic, anarchic, personal ambitions and projects? And similarly, solidarity, belonging, always contains a critique of authority, which is seen as being uh, excessive and interposing. Uh, sorry, I have a phone going off in the background. It'll stop in a second. And individualism is a kind of critique of the overbearingness of authority and the, the, the problems of solidarity. So each of these are critiques of each other. Secondly, each of them is pathological. That is to say, too much authority is highly problematic. Too much solidarity is highly problematic. Too much individualism, and this is something that I think we have finally realized, is problematic um, uh, uh, as well. And thirdly, even when... As we saw with the post-war settlement, as we see in organizations, as we see with policies, you do combine these three forces in a dynamic way. Any kind of major change in the environment upsets the balance because changes in the environment privilege particular things. You know, when there's a threat, we tend to lean into authority. Or when in periods of affluence, we tend to think we, we just need freedom and aspiration. We don't need anything else because everything is going brilliantly. So changes in the environment unbalance this. So it's a constant battle. So that takes me 
to my, my final point, which is an attempt to put together those two ideas. And what I want to argue is that the age we should be trying to create is the reflexive age. And what I mean by that is an age when we are more aware as human subjects of this reality. We are aware of the characteristics of systems which work. So we think much more systemically at all levels of society. We understand things through the, through the idea of systems rather than through the idea of kind of levers, or, you know, single mechanisms, single interventions. We think of the system as a whole and we have an understanding of the dynamics of systems. And I've offered one way of thinking about a system. But also that within society, within these different domains of society, there is a reflexive capacity to understand the problems with each of these subsystems. And of course, when we talk about hierarchy or we talk about authority, we talk about belonging and we talk about individual aspiration. These broadly, although, although not absolutely, map onto state, civil society and market. And so the reflexive age is an age where leaders, for example, understand the inherent problems of leadership. They understand the inherent difficulties of authority. And they are aware of and deal with that, the need to continuously renew their legitimacy, for example. Um, and so leaders have this reflexive capacity to understand the limits of authority, the dangers of authority. Equally, that when we talk about solidarity and uh, as people of the left, we, we feel a solidarity is our thing, belonging is our thing. We understand the pathologies of belonging. We understand that tribalism is, it drives us to do behave in an other, other regarding way, but also tribalism drives the most appalling forms of behavior, the most sectarian forms of behavior. Uh, and so how we create, how we craft forms of solidarity which give people a sense of belonging but don't deteriorate into tribalism or into kind of identity mongering, that too is a reflexive project. And then finally, and actually I would say this, and I'd end with this, is actually the area where I think in a way we've advanced most, and that is a reflexive individualism. Because of course, neoliberalism told us that, ne that individualism was not unproblematic, that if we all simply pursued our own desires, the world would thrive. And we have now all read our behavioral economics, our social psychology, and we understand that this is not only an arid account of humanity, it's an entirely inaccurate account of humanity. And that in fact, if our personal project is one of autonomy, if, our, our, if, if, our, if we want to be the authors of our own lives, it, under, it means that reflexive capacity to understand all the ways in which human nature is flawed, all the ways in which simply doing what we want is not gonna end up giving us the lives uh, that we want, all the ways in which the market, however dynamic it is, however much we need it to solve problems, including problems like climate change, is also pathological. And so I urge the progressive movement to be unashamedly thoughtful, even intellectual at this time, in, in being the voice of those who understand that the changes that we want in society and the most important of course is the response to the climate emergency but the second is how do we reconcile the need for economic uh, dynamism with the need for social justice that we understand that these are systemic challenges and that whatever our place is in the system we have that reflexive ability to understand the nature of the task in which we're involved in the system in which we are participating thank you well, thank you, Matthew, for this very rich, um, very deep reflection. We've, you've given us a lot of food for thought for further discussion. Matthew Taylor, Chief Executive of um, the Royal Society of Arts. I'm afraid I forgot to mention your role and function in the beginning, but I assumed subconsciously that in this round, uh, you're a well-known figure. So excuse me for that. Um, after this, uh, this introduction and especially bridging the PGS 19 and PGS 20, we understand how important it is to keep this conversation going. 
and to keep, uh, uh, to, to keep asking us questions. What is the role of progressives and how can progressives shape um, the future and shape it effectively to bring a long lasting and tangible change. And so um, I'd like to bring another well known person in our circles to the conversation now. Uh, Anke Hasse, who is the professor of public policy at the Hertie School here in uh, Berlin. She was also scientific director of Hans Böckler Stiftung, um, so the foundation of the tr German trade unions. And she's also a great friend of the Spolka Zentrum, being a member of our scientific uh, council. And we've invited her uh, to join us today and to respond uh, to Matthew's uh, introduction and to share with us her thoughts on possible ways forward. So Anke, please, the floor is yours. <clears throat> thank you, and thank you very much for inviting me and letting me be part of this conversation, which I find exciting and also very important. And I think back of, the, of last year's conference, when I listened to Matthew Taylor, when he uh, explained his thoughts at the time on, of, of the reflexive uh, age, and I remember how excited I got and I found it exhilarating and very motivating to think about future challenges in this way and to uh, take things forward because there were deep thoughts on how society is organized, how people in society actually relate to each other and what is the relationship between the individual and society. So I thought this was a, you know, a great presentation and also today again a, a great presentation. So what I want to do now is um, to ask a couple of questions, but also maybe to present a slightly different picture where I have a different take on what you presented. Because I do actually think that between last year's Progressive uh, Governance Summit and this year's, a lot of things have happened and a lot of things have evolved that might change the perspective on where we are. And when you outlined your, the, the big broad themes over how uh, modern societies have changed over the last hundred years when we look at the post-war settlement, when we look at the crisis, the old crisis in the 1970s, the move towards neoliberalism, and now we are in the, in, in the transition phase to a new regime. And I fully share the perspective that we are now transitioning to something very different from what we have seen in the past. And the financial crisis was a challenge uh, to the liberal uh, regime. And we see that you know, the liberal regime, the neoliberal regime, managed quite well to come out of the financial crisis and to pretend, to pretend that not much has happened and that we can continue as we did before. I think now we're at a stage where we, do not con we, where we cannot pretend this anymore. And I think that has to do with two factors. And one factor is the discussion on climate change. I think with each year that is passing by, and we can see the effects of global warming that uh, in our own countries and how it impacts societies immediately, this conversation is getting more and more pressing. And it challenges many ways um, how we have organized our lives, how we're leading our lives, what is the role of mobility in our lives, what is the role of energy, what, what kind of jobs can we actually do in the current system. So I think that the challenge is, is deep and is big and it is not just a minor trend and not just a minor transition where we have to adjust on a minor scale. The second thing that, and, and I think throughout the last year, we have seen in many ways how it will impact our lives in, in a fundamental way. The second aspect that has happened over the last year is the pandemic, of course, and it is the, is the COVID crisis, which has impacted our economies in, to an extent which was unimaginable only three months ago. We would never have expected that the UK, for instance, would be in a situation where GDP will shrink by 20% over, you know, within three months. So this is really unprecedented. Both of these aspects are, are unprecedented and they challenge the, 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 the societies we're living in. And when we look at the responses and what might happen to societies and how it is shaping up now, and we look at the trajectory, what I see is really a fundamental new role of the state because the responses to the COVID crisis has been, have been responses by the state. And the, the state has already intervened massively in the liberal or previously thought to be liberal system of capitalist organization, but also of labor markets, also the, how the welfare states are, are, are run, 
And it, it, the, the state has taken over a much more fundamental role. And we need the state. We need the state also to reorganize our societies to combat climate change. We cannot solve the crisis of mobility, of energy, of production, of how we want to live, if the state does not intervene into the relations between the producers and the consumers, but also how we, we, uh, we organize our workplaces. So the state has a big role and the state um, will have an even a, a bigger role when we look a little bit ahead or how, you know, at how we come out of this crisis. A lot of people assume that what we will see is a K-shaped recovery of the crisis. So initially we thought this would be a V-shaped recovery. We would have a deep dip and then we would come out of this crisis very quickly and we resume things as they were before. But we do not expect this anymore. So the K-shaped recovery actually means that the upper half of the society, the people who are highly educated, who have secure jobs, who can work from home, they will come out of the crisis just fine because they have continued to work and their jobs are pretty much safe. But there's also another half of society and this other half, the lower half of societies are either people who have lost their jobs already, who are in some kind of short-term working or partial unemployment scheme at the moment, or these are the people who work on the front line, who, have to, who had to go out to work during the pandemic and who had to experience great health risk. And what we see now if we look at very closely is that the crisis exposes a lot of the weaknesses in societies and it exposes it in particular in these uh, in societies which we thought as uh, more neoliberal you know the liberal countries the english speaking countries have fared in the crisis much worse because their welfare systems their protective system has been weaker compared to other countries in particular of the of continental europe so we see this already and if we think ahead a little bit, we see that the gap between those who are doing well after the crisis and those who are not doing well after the crisis, that this gap is, is likely to become a bigger if we don't intervene. And for that, again, we need, a, we need state capacity. So for me, if I look at what has happened a year ago, you know, how were we, where were we a year ago and where are we now? I think the role of the state and state capacity and administrative capacity has become a much more powerful topic in this conversation. And this is where I um, bring in your, your thoughts about belonging, your thoughts about um, uh, authority, how we obey authority, but also your, your, your thoughts about aspirations. And this is to do with the human nature in society. So how do we as individuals how do we respond to that? And I think that populism, for instance, populism is a good example of what you described, because I think that people sort of were attracted by populist movements were exactly for the reasons you described, because there was an element of authorities. There were people who were very clearly in their views and said, we have the solutions. We as progressives didn't like the solutions of populists, but it was attractive for, uh, for many people. And it gave them a sense of belonging and it gave them, them a sense of community, which they did not have before. So populism in a way is a proof of what you say, what drives people. And that is where we as progressives have really not uh, kept up and we have to do better in order to approach these people and to make the same offerings to people. So we as progressive have to offer hope, but we have to offer hope in a fundamentally and very fast changing system. And we obviously have to be able to offer hope to build the bridge between those people who come out of the crisis very well, people like us, and people who will suffer from the crisis for a very long time. And we have to see that these, these, this will lead to conflicts. This will not lead to a reflexive age. I'm very skeptical whether we, what we see as a result of the crisis is more reflexivity and a better awareness of policymakers, of politicians, but of, also of those people who are affected. I think we will see a, a many responses by many people. People will be angry. People are already angry at the moment if we look at racial conflicts in the United States, but also in parts of Europe. And this is an anger, an underlying anger, because the unfairness of the system is exposed and becomes very, uh, becomes very clear. So when we as progressives look at this, I think we have to take the anger very seriously. We have to take the conflicts, but also the inequities in societies as we see them developing now very seriously. And we have to think about the state and we have to think about how can we make use of the state capacities that we have, 
and how can we use them to bring uh, to develop more solutions. So this is not arguing against the reflexive age and it's not arguing against the insights of what you're putting forward, but I think the, the picture has changed, the surrounding picture has changed. Thank you very much, Anke, for bringing this different perspective to the table and enriching our discussion. Um, before I hand over back to Matthew so that he can respond uh, to what Anke has just said, I would like to remind uh, you all, friends and colleagues in the call, that you can also join this conversation. So please raise your hand if you would want to com comment on what has been said or ask a question either to Anke or to uh, Matthew or both of them or uh, anybody. Uh, I, I will, I will uh, note down who uh, would want to join uh, this debate and uh, invite you to do so after Matthew has spoken. So please just raise your hand or, or send me questions in the chat via the chat function. But now, uh, Matthew, the floor is yours again. Yeah, so Anka, that was really, uh, really interesting. And, 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 and it, I mean, it makes me, first of all, want to say, look, I, I absolutely want to say I am not predicting the future. I, indeed, I have come to the conclusion, mainly in relation to conversations about technology and the future of work, that prediction is a reactionary activity because prediction is, denies human agency. Prediction says this is what is going to happen. And prediction is often used uh, people, the Silicon Valley folk are particularly fond of prediction because it's a way of telling people the future is kind of predetermined and therefore what you need to do is lie down and accept it rather than the reality, which is that the future is highly contingent and, um, and to, it is up, up to us in many ways to craft that future. So I am not predicting an age of reflexivity or the reflexive age. What I'm saying is that that might be the way in which we want to organize ourselves in order to try to win the, the battle, the battle to be the force which determines the next stage of human development. The second thing I want to say is, uh, and I, I'm not going to respond at length, but you talked about the state, Anka, and, and I, of, of course, one of the things that people are saying um, about the crisis, and a lot of people on the left are saying this gleefully, is, you know, this is great because the state has become really important. And you know this is good for social democracy because in the end we want a big state. And that's what separates us from the right because the right wants a small state. I think I wanna argue that I don't believe that progressives should have a view about whether or not the state should be big or small as an absolute objective. The objective we have is human liberation. And what we're interested in is the state that we need in order to most assist with human liberation and progress. And indeed, you know, one of, the, one of the people I've spoken to that's most impressed me over the last few weeks, I have a podcast series called Bridges to the Future, where I talk to people about what they think will happen after the crisis. And I spoke to Audrey Tang. Now, Audrey Tang is a member of the Taiwanese government. She happens to be a trans woman. I mean, I only say that because in a sense, becoming aware of her and her history as somebody who became a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, retired at 33, came back to Taiwan, was involved in a student protest and is now in the government. It's just a kind of fascinating kind of modern fable, really. But Audrey Tang talked about why the Taiwanese government has been so effective in the COVID crisis. And she talked about the Taiwanese government's response, which was organized under three principles, fast, fair and fun. Right. I can't I cannot imagine three ideas more alien to people sitting in Britain than the idea that a government response could be fast, fair and fun. We have had a response that has been slow, uh, unfair uh, and uh, about as fun as a visit to the dentist. So, um, uh, so what, what I think is interesting about the Taiwanese story is that Taiwan went through a moment about five years ago called the Sunflower Revolution, which was a moment when students revolted against the plans for Taiwan to have a trade deal with China and to allow Chinese state technology companies to take over the Taiwanese technology infrastructure. And this was a moment of protest. And it was a moment when people called the state to account and said to the state, this is not the state we want. We do not want a state that does deals with China and has a kind of hierarchical paternalistic model. 
And so it led to a reimagination of the state, much more civically vibrant. And what one of the reasons Taiwan has done so well in the crisis is because the way it uses technology, the way it engages its citizens is, is highly engaged. And now Audrey, I listen to Audrey, and she is a remarkably progressive, dynamic figure to me. But she describes herself, she describes herself as a conservative anarchist. And what she means by a conservative anarchist is that, I, I asked her about this, she would like a state that in a sense dissolves itself because it becomes indistinguishable from civil society. Yeah? So when I talk about the reflexive state, I want a state that understands that when the state grows, it generates all kinds of pathologies and problems. And that if social democracy sounds like a, a philosophy that says we are ultimately measured by how big the state is, we ain't going to win many friends, I think, because I don't think many people see that as being the objective of social progress. Instead, the question is what kind of state most empowers us as individuals and enables the power of solidarity to be a positive one in society? Because to go back to the theory that I articulated before, if you think about authority and you think about belonging stroke solidarity and you think about autonomy aspiration and you think about them having good forms and bad forms, benign forms and malign forms, I would say that the benign form of each is the one which is compatible with the others. That is to say the benign form of authority is one which maximizes the space for individual freedom and aspiration and self-authorship and it maximizes the space for spontaneous, solidaristic, collectivist action in society, for people doing things together themselves rather than having things done for them. So I think this is a really interesting moment, Anka, because you're right. In one way, it's a good moment for progressives because we understand the state. We're not, in, we're not hostile to the state in the way the right is. We understand the state. We believe it can be a force for good. And this is been demonstrated by COVID and good states with good capacity and good relationships and legitimacy have done best and chaotic, populist, corrupt states have done worse. But I would say to you, and this is exactly my point about reflexivity, Anchor. I would say to you at just this point, when we are in danger of going, hooray, it's, it's our time because we can build an enormous state and solve everyone's problems, we must pause and understand all the perils that are involved in statism and actually say what we want to do is to expand the empowering capacity of the state, which might not mean the same as growing the size of the state, but it means it is, means running the state, believing it can be a force for empowerment, which the right does not believe, but understanding that's as much about constraining its natural tendencies as, as expressing those natural tendencies. Can I say something? Of Maria? course. Please respond. You were, you were really, <laughs> you already mentioned many times on that address. So please do, and then we will take questions from from others. So I'm I'm not a part of the group who says, "Hooray!" You know, the left has won. We're now in a situation where the state can take over, and this will solve our problems. Because I rather the opposite. I, I, I sorry, you know, I wasn't the, trying to caricature you. Anger, no, no, no. Sorry. I know, I know. But uh, you know, the, the 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 situation is as such that the state will be crucial in how we organize the transition. I do believe that. And that has to do with climate change and it has to do with the crisis. And we will see, we, are, we, are, we will de de depend on good governance much more than in the past. I think that is something we can agree on. Absolutely. I don't think that this is necessarily sort of a, a, a good sign for the left because we say, you know, we understand the state. This is a great opportunity. We just have to hijack the state and then we can do all the things we always wanted to do. And this is, uh, and we're in a great situation. I don't think that. But what I do think is that when we, and I also believe that we have to find more and better ways of delivering public service in a participatory way. We have to involve people, we have to include people, and we have to bring in people, uh, you know, the thoughts and the aspirations of many different, uh, different uh, groups in society. So, so I completely agree with that. I just think that if we look at 
new approaches and we have we see these approaches in in the future of work debate for instance you know where hierarchies break down where organizational models are transformed in very different ways and we see experiments and we see many trajectories in in different industries not just in the, in the tech industry but in other industries where people say we we don't want to live in the same way as the previous generations as my parents generation we have different aspirations we need to change our ways etc i do buy into all of that what i find not obvious and i think where we need to discuss uh, more clearly what it means is how is that related to the center left how it is that related to political participation to the organization of political representation in in um, in our societies because i do not see this as a genuinely sort of center left agenda i think i think this is the agenda we are on you know everyone is on this you know the right is on it and the left is on it where this is where the societies are at and for the center left, if we think about how to include a senses of belonging, how to include senses of solidarity, we have not found a way of relating that to the people we actually want to talk to. Because the people we want to talk to, because we have a sense of social equality, we have a sense of solidarity, these are the, the people who are most likely to, uh, who will suffer from the effects of the pandemic, but also who will suffer from the transition towards a new economy where their jobs will be gone. I mean, the, you know, if we if you look at climate change, if you look at uh, restruct, economic restructuring, if you look at where employment losses will be taking place or have taken place already, these are in groups of society. These, these are the lower middle classes and the working classes where the center left says, you know, these are our constituencies. And I think for them, to say, and I, I know that you're not saying that, you know, for them to say we are in a reflexive age and we, you know, we have more reflexivity and we have more participation and we embrace these topics in a different way. We believe in diversity, etc. I think this will not be good. I do assume that the state has a different role to what it had a year ago or two years ago. And then make this connection and to say, what is the capacities of the state in organizing the transition that those people will not be left behind as they have been over the last 10, 15 years. And uh, what we can see, you know, what's happening after the pandemic with all these people who will have lost their jobs and, you know, will have to give up their jobs because we, we can't uh, afford them anymore. So I think that is the connection we need to make and we need to think more you know, harder about it, you know, what is actually the offering of the center left to this process. Thank you. So um, our discussion develops in a very interesting way with even more questions that we started with. Very good. And I'd like to invite uh, more voices to our conversation. And we start, we will start with Mark Saxer. Uh, who actually already in the very beginning of the pandemic has uh, published a text in which he shared his, his thoughts on what the future can be and the progressives, what they can do with it. So Mark, we are uh, looking forward to your, uh, to your contribution and a, a, a big uh, request to all who will join us. Uh, please just briefly introduce yourself so that we are all on the same page and we know who's speaking this one. Mark, uh, please, the floor is yours. So hi, my name is Mark Saxer. I'm actually with the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, Asia department, uh, but probably not the reason why I'm in this call. Um, I think I, I contributed a little bit to the discussion that we're having right now. And uh, thank you, Matthew and, and Anke for going right to it. Uh, I think the big discussion that we're having is this crisis a turning point or is it not? Um, is it actually leading the way into a new, new era, reflexive or otherwise, or is it not? And I think, uh, what was interesting about both your points uh, was that you have pointed to the puzzle of, of 2008, uh, the strange survival of neoliberalism uh, back then for pretty much the same reasons, you know, the market failed, the state is back, uh, neoliberalism was already declared dead, uh, and it returned with a vengeance, right, uh, the uh, a polarization of wealth and power uh, actually accelerated. So the question is really, uh, is it different this time? And uh, we are facing, and I'm, I'm very much uh, uh, agreeing with Anke here, we're going into a massive distribution conflict uh, over the cost of the crisis. 
in Europe is going to be to the tune of 4 trillion euros uh, that have to be paid by someone. And I think we should no, make no mistakes that neoliberals are calling for the next round of austerity. Uh, we all know what the consequences of that would be in terms of democracy, especially in Southern Europe, uh, in terms of the society, inequality, and so on. So I think that the interesting point, uh, and I think uh, we heard similar points by Danny Roderick, uh, as well as Paul Mason in the conference, um, is does the balance of power shift? Is it different from 2008 going forward or is it not? And I believe that we are at a critical juncture right now where we can see a reconfiguration of social forces. And that has not so much to do uh, with the pandemic and much more to do with the underlying geopolitical and geoeconomic trends. So I'm referring, of course, to the hegemonic conflict between the US and China. I'm uh, conferring to uh, the decoupling that we see, onshoring, reshoring, nearshoring, deglobalization, and so on. I think it's all a bit overstated. We are not going into a deglobalized world, but I do believe that we're going to see the emergence of competing blocks. Uh, if that's uh, zones of influence, uh, as Putin calls them, or if that's just trading blocks, we'll, we'll see. But I think uh, there is a paradigm shift, a redefinition of interest in Europe, and that is that the European market uh, is going to be absolutely crucial for the survival of uh, also the exporting uh, industries of the North. And I think if we look and listen closely to what we've seen, uh, referring to the German, French, and Italian uh, industry federations call uh, for bailout for the South. Um, if we look at the Merkel and Macron plan uh, for the, the, the common uh, debt recovery, um, if we look to and listen to the voices also from the labor unions, I think that more and more social forces are going away from the export model and are actually con uh, going into uh, a redefinition of the interest around a more domestic, and here I mean European market-centered development model. And I believe that this is the biggest opportunity for progressives in decades. Matthew, you basically uh, laid it out. We're going back all the way to the late 70s when the late para uh, paradigm shift happened. This is the next paradigm shift where we can actually capitalize on the reconfiguration of uh, societal forces around a new platform which goes away from globalization uh, um, as an end in itself, but basically looks at the uh, demand-driven development model and focuses on the domestic European market. And this will open the field for progressive projects much more than anything we've seen in decades. So my, my point here, and this is also my question, is please, um, we, we need these big narratives, uh, but uh, please focus on the political economy because we cannot afford to lose this opportunity once more. Thank you very much, Max and uh, Mark. And uh, looking at the questions, we actually have more uh, in the line. So um, I would suggest I will bundle them in pairs uh, to uh, make sure that we have enough time to address all of them. And now I will ask uh, uh, Ophelie uh, to come up with her question. Ophelie, the floor is yours. Please introduce yourself briefly and um, continue with your contribution. Hi, um, thank you um, very much for those very interesting presentations. Um, so I'm Ophelie, um, I'm a federalist uh, activist. Um, I've been uh, for a couple of years um, recently um, visiting fellow as, at um, Das Progressive Zentrum. Um, and I got quite struck by something that um, Enke Hassel said uh, about this um, anger that um, we, we, we see and we witness um, from the people uh, after the pandemic um, in, in different, um, um, yeah, different aspects um, of society, whether that's um, racial aspects, whether that's economic aspects, but, um, and, and, and really we, we can see this anger emerging, some of it being already present, um, um, like already there, but not really tackled, um, some of it being created um, by, by the pandemic itself. 
Um, and I very much agree that we can all feel this this anger in our societies, and, and at least um, here in France, you, you can feel that the, the social climate is, is quite complicated. Um, and you were mentioning the role um, of the state in, in rebuilding um, societies. Um, and I would say that at least for now, we, we sort of witness that the state doesn't really seem um, able to, to answer to this anger um, and to this, this social um, critical climate. Um, and I was wondering if you already had some something we, of, you've already had some some thoughts or, or some practical actions that progressives can actually um, implement to um, to channel this anger because um, I think that um, there is there could be a positive um, outcome in being able to channel um, the anger and um, re like making sure that we can achieve some 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 critical changes out of that which would be positive changes but i also fear that if we don't manage to channel the anger properly then it could be left to populist which would uh, then um, endanger democracy very much so i would like to hear your thoughts about that thank you Ophelie. so anke would you like to start <clears throat> yes, and, and I, I will start with Ophelie and, and her question, you know, how should progressives um, um, respond to that? I think the, the way that governments have um, responded to the crisis, both in terms of health policies, but also now in economic terms, they all have distributive impacts and they all, are, you know, favor some groups of society and they all discriminate against other groups of society. And we can... Um, we should look at these recovery packages and we should look at how they impact different groups and societies. And we should definitely look at how they impact those groups who are vulnerable. And, and, and I sort of said who these groups are. I mean, you know, we have young people, we have uh, ethnic minority people, we have people who have to go out and, and uh, work in frontline jobs in essential services. We have people who lost their jobs and people who might be excluded. And we have the young people. I mean, young people will be hit by the crisis much more than, uh, than middle-aged or old elderly people. So we should look at these um, different effects the crisis has on different groups of society. And we should really call out governments on how um, their recovery packages impacts and to what extent they are able to compensate for losses that these groups and societies have made. So that is one sort of very clear way of how progressives could look at it and say, you know, we know what the different effects are, we know what should, have, should happen, and we can call out governments, you know, to, to respond in a better and in a fairer way. And we can develop criteria, what would be a fair response? How should we make sure that young people are able to be reintegrated into the labor market, keep their jobs, are not discriminated against? How, you know, for instance, families have been massively hit by the crisis. Young children have been hit uh, incredibly hard by the closures of, of schools, for instance, and in particular, you know, children in families who are not well off. So we should look at that, we should address that, and we should think about what can governments do in order to help out these children? What, what do we expect from an effective government response to deal with this crisis? I think that is what, what progressives should do actually now and say, you know, these are our expectations, these are our proposals, and this is what should happen. But beyond the, the state and beyond governments, I think we also have to engage in a much broader um, societal conversations about how to respond to uh, increasing cleavages and conflicts because you know we all play a role in conflicts that we see now and we can all contribute to overcoming these conflicts and we can all be part of this conversation and again i think for for the uh, for progressives we should open up spaces where we can have conversations about our colonial past, for instance, but also about discrimination in, the, in societies, about diversity. How can we actually facilitate diversity? And Matthew uh, talked about the, the, um, the minister in, in the Taiwanese government who obviously came from a um, minority background in, in many ways, or was a very sort of colorful figure in, in her own uh, in, in her own uh, life, but she, you know, we, we need to find ways to have these conversations to, to create safe spaces and to create a 
a uh, situation in which we have conversations where people are free to express whatever their life choices are. And we should, we have to make sure that this does, you know, that discrimination that happens every day in our streets and in our societies will be addressed and called out. I think we can be much more open and much more outspoken about these things. Thank you much for, uh, thank you very much, Anka, for bringing also that uh, important topic. Um, Matthew, what are your thoughts on the question that we've received. Uh, but, uh, please just uh, yeah, demute yourself. Schoolboy error. Um, okay, yeah, so in relation to Mark's question, um, I would argue that what we have seen is individualistic globalization by which i mean financial globalization so we've seen market globalization and we have seen hierarchical globalization in the sense of the creation of governance institutions generally speaking detached from legitimacy uh, and so those institutions are not loved um, they don't have deep roots and what has been missing from this story is the global the, uh, uh, a globalization of belonging that is to say a globalization based upon a changing understanding by citizens of the tribes to which they belong and that has led to globalization which has been dynamic but also unbalanced and malign in many of its consequences and also as we have seen in the last few months fragile in some very important ways how do we go forward in this? My view is not so much that we should seek to reverse globalization, but that we should seek to balance it. And what that means is that I think we need to think about how we introduce the solidaristic domain of glo globalization to balance its market form and its hierarchical form. And I believe that, and I think this probably chimes with what you said, Mark, I believe that the only realistic way to do that is to have a policy which says we are explicitly closer to, more willing to trade with, more open to those countries who share our values. Um, and therefore that uh, uh, we should be unashamedly saying, for example, when it comes to trade, uh, that we will want to trade with countries that share our commitments on climate change or labor protection or whatever and that we will impose those standards and say to people if you want to trade with us if you want economic globalization with us you have to recognize the importance to us of our value systems and that's something we have to work we're going to have to work through so i i agree with mark in a sense that i think that it may be that the next stage of globalization is one that is around uh, these kind of three poles of China and America and the European Union. And I think that the progressive position um, is not to be anti-globalization, but is to be in favor of a globalization which is more balanced and which is underpinned by a set of values which we should adhere to more firmly and with more courage than we have done in the past. We have we paid lip service to this, but we haven't stuck with it. I understand that, that, that there are problems with all of that and you know, maybe we can talk about those about then, you know, what, what, what right do we have to impose liberal democracy on others? Well, I don't think we do. What I'm saying is that our task is not to change China. Our task is to say we will work most closely with those who share our values because those are our values. And because if, if globalization is not about being able to hold on to your values, if globalization is seen as something which undermines your values, then it will lose legitimacy in the way that it, it has done. And then in relation to Ophelia's point um, about anger, I, I just, I mean, I, I would say what I said before, which is about what we need is a kind of reflexive form of politics and authority. And I do believe actually that, that part of the role of politics is a quasi therapeutic role. The good politics is partly about, as it were, putting the public on the couch, a public that is angry and confused and enabling that public to understand more richly what is going on and to understand that, you know, solutions are difficult. And not only are solutions difficult, but that most solutions involve citizens themselves participating in those solutions. And if that sounds naive, I would simply refer you to the growing evidence about deliberative democracy. 
And it is absolutely clear that deliberative democracy, which engages people at all levels of education, all different types of society, and brings them together over a sustained period to hear a variety of arguments, to be informed about an opinion, and then to reach judgments, that overwhelmingly, and in stark contrast, I would say, to representative democracy, deliberative democracy works. People enjoy it. Uh, people are able to collaborate and they come up with ideas which are generally speaking good ideas and which can then help representatives because ultimately we have to have representative democracy you can't run countries through deliberation but deliberation is a kind of therapeutic form of democracy people enter into it with one set of attitudes and assumptions and they go through it and their attitudes and their assumptions develop and they develop and they change and this is an idea that was there at the origins of democracy but which we have lost um, and so I think the only way you work through that anger awfully is to have a form of democracy which recognizes that democracy is a space in which people grow and develop, in which people are able to transcend their anger rather than simply to parade and to display their anger, uh, or a space in which politicians merely pander to people's prejudices. Thank you. Um, let me bring uh, some voices and questions from the platform to our conversation. And so um, an, interesting, an interesting question reads as follows. Uh, it would be great if you could comment on the perspective by Matthew Goodwin, who argued for less identity politics from the left and a new mindset regarding compromise or dialogue with a currently a culturally conservative or insecure segments in our societies. So that's our first question that came to us through a platform. Thank you very much for submitting it. Uh, the next one uh, inquires about how do we square all that uh, with the rise of misinformation in the West? If there is less of objective reality to base arguments on, how do we reach out to each other with compromise and then move forward? So um, a little bit uh, to the direction of the first question. And then uh, please allow me to uh, also invite Andreas Adrech to our conversation who also wanted to um, ask you also with regards to those questions from the platform. Andreas? All right, um, firstly, um, starting with me, you asked for some, um, some information. Um, I'm policy fellow here in the Progressive Center, and um, I'm working, or I worked in the last year for different federal ministries in uh, Germany. I would like to comment on what uh, came from the platform, and also a little bit on what Mark Sachser actually said. And uh, coming back to what uh, was written at the platform, um, it was the question whether the left, the center left, um, should um, argue for less identity politics and uh, go towards a compromise with culturally con conservative segments of society. And that's a question that always, always comes up when we are talking these, uh, about these things and when we are talking in progressive center-left uh, communities. And uh, before I say why, I just want to say I think that's totally wrong. That's the totally uh, wrong direction that we would go when we do just that. Um, because I think that when we do this, we lose the whole vision, the whole idea that we should actually be presenting. Um, when you ask me, I think that the, the big question uh, is at the crossroads. Are we going towards saving privileges of some people or are we actually going to, um, to start realizing a vision of equality for all? That's the huge, the big questions that we have to, to, uh, to answer. And um, the right-wing populists that we see, um, they are always arguing uh, in favor of privileges of some people. So privileges of Christians, privileges of uh, white people, privileges of men, privileges of heterosexual people, privileges of people that have a lot of money at the moment and economic power and so on. And the idea that we are supposed to present is that equality is actually better for all in all these cases. And we want to go, if we want to go through this huge transformation that we definitely have to go through, climate change and everything, uh, Anke Hassel have, has mentioned that, um, then we have to um, stick to the vision that 
if we act in the face of climate crisis, we can do it in a way that it is better for all, because it's equal for all in the end. And if we um, end the, the, the racism in society, then it's better for all because it's more equal for all in the end. And you can go through all the, to the topics. It's the same thing, coal miners, for example, something that is always brought up. If we manage to be at a point in the end where we can tell them, if we do this transformation, it's better for you, but because it's better for all, because it's better for the equality of all. So that's the idea. If we start uh, sticking only to the economic questions, then we destroy our vision. Then we destroy everything that we can that we can bring forward to counter what the what the other side, the the, the um, populists, the right wing populists, um, are actually saying. And uh, last sentence connecting this to what Matthew said. Um, I would do it in in in, in the following. If we want if we want to um, come to more sense of belonging, then we must not do it in a way that we are excluding others. We can come to, to a sense of belonging if we are just saying we're sticking to a small white group and excluding the others. Then we have a sense of belonging. That's what Donald Trump does and that's what many other populists are doing. But that's the, the way of coming to belonging that we don't want and that will never ever uh, achieve the, uh, um, the, that, that what we are actually um, wishing to create in the, in the society. The same thing, personal ex, uh, aspirations. Um, if we are going there at the expense of others, then we, we will destroy the vision, then we will destroy everything that progressives can put forward. So um, uh, going into the direction uh, of that, what apparently Matthew Goodwin said, and that what came here from the platform, and that is always and always again and again discussed in uh, left center progress progressive um, discussions. That is the worst we can actually do. Thank you very much for that strong statement. Um, and I see still oh, one more hand in the air uh, that's been there for a longer period, and now it's probably almost withering. Michael Miebach, the floor is yours. Please jump in with your comment. Yeah, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I'm Michael Miebach. I'm the chair of Das Progressive Zentrum. And this, uh, my question fits pretty well to what Andreas Audrich just said, because I'm not so sure whether his approach is the right one. Uh, but first, let me start with saying that I found both of your presentations very, very inspiring. And I found it uh, good that you uh, led us to understanding, Matthew, that COVID is not uh, only changing the economy, not only changing the role of the state, but also cultural dimensions of how our society works. I found that very, very inspiring. And um, because this session is also about reflecting about the conference. Um, so let me start that this discussion, but also other discussions that we had throughout the conference, I think were uh, good in the way that we exchanged views about the current state of things. One famous social democrat about 150 years ago said, all politics starts with saying what is the reality. And I think we are in this conference, we did this very well. And, um, but I would like to, uh, to, do, to uh, emphasize or ask you if you agree that progressives uh, who are good in, in describing the reality and also I think uh, on the verge of being able to describe the progressive narrative pretty good at the moment, because a lot of factors uh, play into our hands at the moment. Would you agree that we have two weaknesses that we have to work uh, on? The first weakness is that my impression is that lots of times we are good in describing uh, a vision, but we neglect the policy level of the discussion. So we, we should work harder on concrete proposals of how we can actually change things in the societies. For example, a lot of talk about the role of the state, which is important, of course, on an abstract level, but 
you know, 15 years ago in Germany, we had a debate about state reform, about reforming the bureaucracy, about new uh, forms of public management and so on. I think these debates about the state are uh, very neglected, for example. Other topic, just a second uh, example, solidarity. Yes, we all agree we need solidarity in, in the COVID crisis, but how do you actually organize burden sharing if you do not simply want to tax the wealth, which, by the way, will be very hard to do and very problematic. And if you want to tax the wealth, you have to make a concrete proposal of how you want to do it. So do you agree that that is maybe something we had to have to work on harder? And if this is true, then the, of course, the danger here is that we overpromise and underdeliver once we are in government or when we are in the government. The second point, uh, is uh, very um, close to what uh, the Honorable Andreas Audrich uh, just said. Um, <laughs> my feeling is that progressives sometimes want to convince the audience. And my fear is that the ability to convince people who have values, who have experiences throughout their lives are somehow limited. So in a way, our narrative, our progressive policies, our progressive politics need to align, get in line with the audience. And I think there is, um, yeah, there's a border and I'm, I'm really sometimes not sure how, how we manage to, to combine those. Too. So I, I'm really interested in what, what if you agree on that and how you you suggest we, you know, cross this bridge. Okay, thank you very much. Well, a lot of material to work with. Uh, who of you would like to crack on those questions? Matthew, Anke? I would like to say something about identity politics. Please do. Yeah, because um, I, it is a sort of underlying issue and comes up all the time and it is really important. So if we look back on the century of social democracy and which is also the century of democratic capitalism in the advanced countries, you know, ever since the, the industrial revolution, it is also the century of the white male, the leader of the household or the head of the household. So it is combined and connected to a family structure and a societal structure which is complementary. The way factories were built, the way um, modern workplaces were built, they were built for um, manufacturing uh, 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 blue color workers who were male, who had wives at home and who had their families at home. And they were the, 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 the people who earned the money for, for their families. So what we've seen in terms of uh, the changes in society over the last 50 years at least is, and we, uh, the, the rise of diversity, we see the rise of women in the workplace, we see also of different uh, identities in the workplace. And we, we see a lot of diversity uh, in that. And the, the rise in diversity has challenged the way we organize our societies and it has challenged the, the way we organize also workplaces, organizations, uh, factories, uh, and so on. And I think that is the big challenge. You know, how can we coexist or how can we make diversity work, not only in the labor market, but also in society as a whole? And that addresses identity politics, because if we say, you know, the white male is not the dominant group in society, which is uh, privileged and in, you know, in, in the century of social democracy, it was the white male who was privileged in many different ways when it came to the welfare state, welfare provision, protection, protection against risk, it was always, and in, in, in this country, it is still the white male who benefits the most from the welfare state, for instance, in pension policies. So if we say, you know, we, we cannot um, justify these privileges anymore because our societies have become so much diverse and the role of women is so different from uh, the times when these welfare systems were conceived, the question is, do we replace the white male with somebody else, with other groups, or are we actually able and competent enough to live without social groupings and without tribes? Because the, the, you know, the, populist, the, the role of the populist is very clear. They address 
the perception that many men have is that they are losing out in the process of diversity. Yeah, they're losing their privileges and they are lashing out against other societal groups because they want to defend their privileges. And I think we can agree pretty easily that this is not a progressive vision that these groups have. But the, the question is really, what is the alternative? What other group, do we need another group that comes into a place that is then the not dominant group? Or can we say, do we have a universal uh, vision of societies where we say we do not have dominant groups, but we have a universal um, understanding of how societies should work and that every individual in society has the same uh, rights and the same expectations towards the state. If that is the case, we have to really have to restructure a lot of our institutions because a lot of our institutions still protect the white male in their positions, either on the labor market or in, in, in social security institutions, etc. And I think this is the discussion uh, we, we have to uh, have. And that also connects to what Matthew was saying earlier on when he talked about belonging. You know, wh what do we belong to? Do we belong to a local space? Do we belong to our families? Do we belong to our uh, communities? And how do we define these communities? And that is when we start sort of talking about identity politics. Do we identify primarily as being gay or heterosexual or as being a woman or a man? Or, and if, while in reality, all of us have all of these identities, you know, we have several identities and we have to combine um, a, a number of different identities and uh, in ourselves. And if, you know, if we start to have a political discussion to say, you know, for me, the sexual orientation is my, my primary identity and I want to fight for gay rights. And this is really, you know, where I'm acting politically. I think this is a dead end. You know, we really have to come to a much more universal and much more diversity driven understanding of policy making and also forging political coalitions. And that it would be my, my answer to, to, to identity politics. No, we should not go down the route of the identity politics. Thank you so much. Matthew, what's your take? Yeah, I mean, uh, wow, this is, I'm exhausted. I think my first take is I'm just exhausted by, I mean, this is a really big, uh, complex set of issues and trying to weigh, find a way of, of responding is hard. I, I, so I, I'll make two points. I, I, I want to make first a response to, to Michael, who, who urges us to think about policy uh, in more concrete terms. And uh, what I would say towards that is that uh, there is actually quite a strong evidence base um, that policies that work are policies which fit the template which I described in my speech. So that is to say they are policies uh, which uh, combine being well designed based upon competence and expertise that's the authority part they are policies that are seen to be legitimate that is to say the public understands the policy and understands the reason for the policy and also those policies broadly speaking align with people's own choices and preferences that is to say those policies are implementable because they're based on a realistic understanding of how human beings actually behave, what actually drives them. And I, a major survey of policies all around the world two years ago found that these are the, these are the three characteristics of successful policies, the, the design, the legitimacy, and the realism of implementation with a particular focus on what people's actual kind of motivations uh, uh, are. And I think that one of the implications of that is that when we think about policy, we need to make sure that we don't try to drive policies that don't meet those kind of quite tough criteria. Criteria. So, to, to make this concrete, uh, to give this a concrete example, I uh, am a supporter of universal basic income, and the RSA is, you know, globally one of the organisations that's uh, been very bit much part of this debate about UBI. But yet, if Boris Johnson was to phone me tomorrow, uh, perish the thought, but if Boris Johnson was to phone me tomorrow and say, Matthew, I've been reading the RSA stuff and I'm going to introduce the universal basic income, I would say to him, no. I would say, please, please don't. 
because universal basic income does not yet have the legitimacy that it needs. And it doesn't even have designed into it the, four, the, the, the kinds of expectations and norms that you would need in order for it to win that legitimacy. So if universal basic income was implemented tomorrow, I, th I think that it would founder very, very quickly because it's a massive policy and it requires social mobilization, social conviction for it to be, uh, to be successful. So when it comes to the, I haven't spoken much about the specificities of policy today, partly because this is an international event and, and you know, every country is different and its policy frameworks, its public services, its fiscal arrangements are very different. So there's not that much carryover. But I think if you look at why it is policies succeed, why some policies change the world, they, they, you know, they make a difference that is unlikely ever to be reversed. It is because they combine those, those components that I, I spoke about. And then in relation to Andreas's point, um, which how can I, I mean, I just disagree. I have to be frank about it in the sense that I think that a, an appeal to absolute equality and universalist belonging is, is unlikely to succeed. And I think we have an enormous amount of evidence it's unlikely to succeed. And it won't succeed because neither of those ideas are ideas that, any, that most of us actually want to operationalize in our own lives. So Andreas, I don't believe that you are merely a citizen of the world. You know, I believe that you belong to all sorts of tribes. And, you know, whether it's your place or your family or the football team you support or whatever it might be, we have belonging. And it is, I'm afraid, a characteristic of belonging that it is something that binds those people in the group, but also to some extent defines difference to those people outside the group and a lower level of affiliation and solidarity to those people outside the group. So solidarity and belonging are absolutely critical. They are critical to our fulfillment and our societies and how we do things, but they contain within them inherent problems which we just need to work with. And so when you look at something like Black Lives Matter, for example, matters, for example, Black Lives Matter, you you need to understand its incredible power and its massively overdue moment and the opportunity it provides for us to redress inequality and for us to try at last to understand the way that privilege is embedded in the way that things are. But on the other hand, you, you need to always also assert that somehow we have to be in the end committed to creating a world of societies and nations where we have something in common that binds us together and that, that therefore this is not in the end a struggle that says success is simply about recognition of, of difference. There has to be a universalizing element to it. So I would say, Andreas, we will always, always have to wrestle with the, the, the Janus faces of belonging, the, the, the two the aspects of belonging which define us in and define other people out and the need to balance all different the complexity of belonging with universalism as far as we can and i would say the same i'm not going to go on about it but i would say about i'd say the same about equality of course we need more equality in our societies and there is overwhelming evidence that the, the level of inequality that our societies suffer is deeply damaging to people's lives and to the resilience of our societies as a whole but it seems to me that a politics that says our ultimate goal is is some kind of absolute equality it stands in the, in the, in the face of, of people's normal values and the way in which they behave themselves, behave in a day-to-day -day way and the way they treat people in a day-to-day -day way. And also it, it, it implies a level of control over society to ensure the maintenance of absolute equality, which I don't think people are willing to accept. They would rather have some inequality than to have the, cow, the kind of supervision of society you would need to have. Instead, and I close with this point, which, which I try to, is, is a way of trying to link all of this. What we need to do is to say, in terms, of, in terms of the articulation of values, which was Michael's point, where is it that our arguments, our progressive arguments, most strike a chord with, with where pe what people intuitively feel and 
where society is. And I believe that when it comes to inequality, the opportunity we have is to do with wealth, not, not nearly so much income, but, but wealth. And, and the ideas that Thomas Piketty has been arguing in his most recent book, which is to, to try to win an argument, which is that the hoarding of wealth is one of the most dysfunctional aspects of our economy and our society. And that what we don't want is absolute equality, but what we do want is to systematically tackle the hoarding of wealth and the replication of inequality over generations uh, because this is deeply scarring to society and flies in the face of people's fundamental sense of what is fair and just. Thank you, Matthew, very much. And don't worry, let's agree to disagree. The plurality of opinions is a, founda is a foundation of democracy and should be a strong suit of, of our progressive family. So it's, it's great to exchange. And that's a fascinating discussion. You wouldn't believe how much activity we have on the platform. Uh, on our event platform, there are many questions uh, asked or comments posted that I'm afraid I cannot bring to this discussion anymore because in the interest of the time, I have to steer us towards uh, the end of that meeting. And before I do that, I promised you that we still touch upon uh, the scenario paper that uh, we prepared um, in the beginning before the conference. Uh, with the intention to give it a sort of direction in which uh, we would like to move with the debates, move with our exchanges, move with our meetings and encounters. And uh, I'd like to ask Florian Ranov, who is my colleague, he runs social and economic transformations in, in DEPETZ, to present maybe three punchlines and um, tell us how the paper that we wrote before the conference resonates with actually what was said uh, during the conference and um, what's the way forward? Florian, the floor is yours. Well, thanks so much, Maria, and um, a great thank you to um, Matthew and Anke. And this was the kind of intellectual final that we were so much um, hoping for and expecting for this to be. And thank you everyone else for coming in. Um, and as Maria um, kind of like just pointed out, um, in the run up to the conference, Matthew, um, especially with your contribution, from last year, um, we were thinking, um, okay, um, we find ourselves in um, a very stressful and a very a challenging situation as societies and as individuals and as an organization. So how can we frame um, this year's conference? And um, we did something um, that we at the DPZ call, um, let's bring the gang together which means um, we reached out to um, our network, to policy fellows, to our board, to our scientific board, and we locked ourselves into a room and um, we um, put on the table some of the big questions um, which um, evolved and, um, around um, the corona pandemic um, along with the social and economic consequences. And um, as a result of the conversations that we had and the deliberation, and in our meetings, and we came up with uh, six scenarios that we've uh, summarized um, in, in our paper, which reach from uh, scenario number one, which was um, the new golden age. So kind of the wish list of progressives where, you know, we'll see over the next five years, um, the happy days um, coming true, where we find a new social contract and where we, we, we stand united as societies, where we um, find a more international cooperation, um, and so on. Um, but that was, um, you know, none of these scenarios um, were kind of like a storytelling or prediction of the future, but rather something that we used um, as a guide to think about the framing of the conference and also um, some of the, the content and the sessions. Beside this new golden age, the second scenario was um, um, a return or actually um, a further engagement with uh, this new, new localism where we retreat to the local perspective and where people try to solve and tackle the big societal problems um, at the local level, um, a trend that um, we've been seeing um, across the world um, where progressives um, have been um, putting forward solutions and policies to tackle climate change, reduce inequalities and so forth. And the third scenario was something that we've already talked about in a way um, is the um, retreat um, and um, the scenario of radical individualism um, where as a consequence of the states 
um, kind of like um, failing maybe um, in the um, containment of a second wave of the pandemic um, to um, you know, provide a safety net for citizens and a retreat um, of us all on, on a very individual level. The fourth scenario um, is, was inspired um, by the um, East Asian um, kind of like um, crisis management um, where we find a state um, taking a very active role um, with um, yeah, kind of like the side effect of uh, liberal and democratic rights being turned down. And the fifth um, scenario um, was um, kind of, um, you know, a trend that we've seen after the global and financial crisis where um, we um, have a new wave of challenger parties, of populists, of nationalists taking to the stage and been able to um, kind of like form a narrative and gain more electoral grounds um, on these scenarios. And the sixth a scenario was just um, kind of like a drop back to what we've been to the crisis before. So taking these uh, six scenarios, we ask ourselves um, the questions of how progressives can win the argument, how they have um, to frame it, and how they don't have to um, or must not retreat to what has happened after the global financial crisis, where we're all um, in the heydays and we're thinking, oh, the center left has won because the causes of the global financial crisis um, were more or less found in the financial ar architecture and in the uh, neoliberalism or era of neoliberalism um, that you've discussed um, at the beginning and at, at, at the very um, introduction um, of, of this debate. And um, across um, these kind of like, you know, the question how we can win the argument, we came up um, with four themes that shaped the conference. And um, actually, um, the idea was um, to ask you a question now um, and something that um, we've, I think we've learned and that's kind of like open and hasn't been touched up on debate was the question of um, where do we see are the new forces emerging in society which now um, have or will lead and change um, these ideas and the kind of progressive policies that we've been talking about. We had a very engaging conversation in London with Francisca Brandner Matthew um, about how climate activists um, have uh, taken to the streets and successfully um, brought the climate emergency to the forefront of politics. Um, and the question now is um, what is happening um, at the very um, level of movement and political parties? Where's the dynamic? Where's the sort of momentum um, in the next few weeks and months? Um, to responding to the crisis. And this is a question that um, we'll unfortunately not be able to answer uh, today, but um, which we can take forward and hopefully discuss in person um, at some point again. Well, thank you very much and um, very much looking forward to the conversations in the future. Thank you very much, Florian, for summarizing um, our paper. It is available. Where is it available, Florian? Just you can download it on the platform and on our website. Sorry. Exactly. So if you are interested in the exact content of that uh, work, which is a collective work of great uh, thinkers and doers, uh, please uh, check it out and uh, download it. And uh, we look forward for, to your feedback. Um, a lot has been said within the last 90 minutes, and it's uh, already a challenge to summarize it. But um, with this task, I would like to reach out to Thomas Kralinski, who is a member of the board of Das Progressive Zentrum and whom we asked to deliver the closing remarks or the closing word for today's, um, for our encounter today. Uh, as uh, for me, thank you very much for all questions, comments, and of course, thank you to our wonderful speakers. And Thomas, now the floor is yours, and I look forward to to hearing uh, what's your take and what are the, what are your takeaways and where are the lessons learned from the debate today? Yeah, thank you for the introduction, dear friends. It's really difficult to summarize an entire week within a couple of minutes. First of all, on behalf of the Progressive uh, Center, I would like to thank everybody. Um, I would really like to thank for following all the different sessions throughout the entire week. Thanks for uh, discussing, thanks for participating, for inspiring, for supporting this uh, wonderful summit. We had about, we had almost 3,000 uh, followers from 70 countries throughout the week with uh, 20 partners and it's just not possible to thank everybody but at this time 
I would really like to thank uh, Matthew Taylor and uh, Anke Hassel again for the enlightening uh, keynote speech um, this um, afternoon. A special thanks uh, also goes to the organizing team. Um, if you have uh, such a complicated event uh, throughout the entire week um, and we're having it running so smoothly, it takes an awful lot of work to do um, in order to have it running so smoothly. So um, just to give a big round of virtual applause to applause to the entire team behind the scene. And if I may say this, as we have a, a conference which was just online, which was pretty new to us, thank you for um, all the insights into your offices and kitchens and living rooms. It was very interesting to see how you're living out there in the world. Um, and I'm sure there have been some inspiration for further decorations for everybody as well. Um, just let me say in the last couple of days, we have been talking about um, uh, important questions, how a future society may look like, like or rather, what can we do um, in order to have a society that cares for everybody, that is sustainable, that is inclusive, and that offers decent jobs for hopefully everybody. A society that is about trust and hope and promise and not about threat and fear. And the six scenarios Florian just um, explained again, I think they painted a good picture um, what is really at stake and what is all this about. Throughout this week, we, I think we all got the notion that there is no going back to the good old times, whatever they have been. Um, and there is no going back to all the role models we know so far or we just had. And therefore, I think we all got the impression, as somebody said to, throughout the conference, that we are in a um, so-called New Deal moment. And I think it's on us to define this moment, to define this moment of a new deal, to make the best out of it, to make the best out of this complicated situation. And it's on us to find solid uh, strategies as well as to build broad coalitions of different political families in order to bring those strategies into, um, into practice, to win the public argument and to win uh, public, uh, to win public uh, support. And, I'm pretty convinced after these days, I think this could be, this can be our moment when we're getting it right. It's a time when no single country can solve problems on their own. Uh, it's a time when we have to um, collaborate. And I think this is why we had this motivating um, conference. I hope at least that it was motivating for you. And uh, what I found is that it's exactly that what happened throughout the week. Um, for me, there have been three things to take home. I mean, I'm actually at home already. Um, it's not about money. It's the first thing, it's about jobs. It's about decent, good jobs. We are currently talking about enormous amounts of money to rescue our economy. But the more important, the most important question, I think, is what are we going to do with all this money? What are we going to do? How we are going to build a new, a value-based, a dynamic economy? What role does state and society play in the future in the economy? For example, when it comes to the development of a carbon dioxide neutral world, when it comes to far more investment, investment in social and digital infrastructure. Secondly, I think it's about equality and solidarity. I think we have to build a society that brings people together, and not um, tearing them apart, that leaves nobody behind. It's about a society for all and not a society of pure individualism. And this is the way I think we can combat populism. It's about a society that not only applauses, but also pays more to the people that work in the um, social work and local community. And uh, I'm pretty sure that this is going to be a very hard fight. And thirdly, and I think this is, for me at least, the, the most important point, it's about trust. I think it's on us to rebuild trust in times of uncertainty, trust in open democracy, um, trust in a decent public administration, a trust in um, a fair state and a good or great society. I think we need also trust in ourselves um, in order to convince people 
about um, the future. That also means that we have to listen, that we have to talk to people, um, take their experience into account, give them the feeling that they are needed, even if they, for example, work in a so-called old economy. And uh, to convince them, I think um, we are there um, and we have to take, uh, show them that we are there at their side to solve problems, to make their life, to make every uh, everyday life a little better day by day. And I think, my friend, this is our mission, if you want to call it like this, it's to rebuild um, trust of the people in the future, in progress. Um, and as we are the people of progress, I think we should always be optimistic about um, the future and that progress is possible and I think this is what the entire week um, at least uh, felt to me that we are on the on the right track. This is now the end of the conference but actually I think it's the beginning. I think it's uh, the beginning of something new. It's hopefully the starting point of a, a new chapter for progressive and what I can assure you that this our journey will uh, continue. We We'll make a suggestion as the Progressive Center for all our partners to continue with this conference. Next year, we have general elections in Germany, so we're in particular interested what you are all thinking, what your experiences are. So what I wish is that everybody now goes home, if, they're not, if you're not there already, um, think about new strategies and put them into practice. And most of um, them tell us about it because um, we are keen to learn from your experience and I think we all should learn from um, each other and uh, sometimes it's just more easy if you don't feel alone on the planet and uh, can share your views with people that are like-minded and I think this is what it's all about. So before now I run out of um, vocabulary, I hope next time around we will see each other in real, have a beer, a coffee, or wine or whatever together, talk and chat to each other. Um, and for the time being, it's just stay healthy and uh, goodbye and good luck. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all speakers, to all participants, to our viewers at the platform, to the wonderful team in the background. Uh, as Thomas said, let's come together. Uh, but for now, enjoy the weekend so that we can start building a progressive future on Monday on. So have a lovely weekend. Thank you for being with us. Goodbye. <laughs>